Yeah, and that what where that strikes me is so interesting, and I try to explain this to people all the time because, well, in the SEAL teams, again, you you might think the same thing. Well, the biggest, toughest SEAL that can destroy everyone else is going to be the leader that everyone looks to, and it's just not true. And in fact, a lot of times those guys that might be the biggest and the strongest and the fastest, they're they're actually arrogant as well because they've they think they can beat everyone and no one wants to work for those people. And so uh, it happened when I first started my consulting business and and I would have, you know, a CEO say, "I can't wait till you come in and just whip my people into shape." Mm-hmm. And I'd say, well, you need to find somebody else that's gonna whip people into shape because I don't do that. <laughs> and, and they couldn't quite put together that me would, would, wasn't into whipping people into shape. And what I wanted to actually do is teach people to lead and to lead people myself. And, and when you're leading, you're not having to whip people. In fact, that's an anything, indica- yeah, that's re- an indication that you're not leading. Exactly. That we, we, as a leader, where I the the place where I usually found myself was, I'm actually having to pull the reins back on people because they're they're going uh, uh, far and away above what I actually would even want and expect them to do. They want to mm-hmm. go even more and do more mm-hmm. to accomplish the mission, and that's where you want to get. And I find it interesting that you know you talk about that all the time. That it's. And it's not the person with the biggest club. It's not the person that's the meanest and the most aggressive. Sure, they might they might rise for a minute. They might get some control, and that happens in any organization. Oh, if you've got a CEO that really he's just a tyrant and everyone's scared of him, he can make some things happen for a little while, and then all of a sudden someone says, "I'm, I'm oh, he wants us to do it that way. I'm going to do a little s- sabotage. Here. Right, exactly. Just a little exactly. sabotage. Your project that you want us to get done by October 31st." Oh, get, got delayed, boss. Yep. And you can go nuts and you can yell and scream, but you should have listened to me when I said we needed more time. And now guess where we are? Yep. We didn't deliver the product we we're supposed to deliver. So you can yell and scream all you want. It's not going to get that product delivered. Yeah, well, and if you tyrannize people badly enough, they'll actually hurt themselves to hurt you. <laughs> so, you know, they're willing to take a, they're willing to take a hit to, to, to reclaim justice, let's say. So yeah, that's really worth knowing. And so one of the things that Jean Piaget pointed out, and and because he was... He's a very interesting psychologist, eh? and, and, and he's never taught properly because, you know, most of these great thinkers were very strange people, and the strangeness gets edited out of their stories. And it's really too bad because they're way more interesting when you know how strange they were. And so Piaget was ob- obsessed with the disjunction between religion and science, and his goal as a thinker was to reconcile the two. And so to some degree, he was looking for a biological basis of morality. That might be one way of thinking about it, or at least to reconcile the idea of a biological substrate with an emergent morality. And one of the things he said is, okay, imagine two systems. All right, so both systems are moving towards a goal, any old arbitrary goal. And in one system, the, the people within it are acting under compulsion. And in the other system, the people within it are acting voluntarily said the people who are acting voluntarily will defeat the people acting under compulsion because in order to use compulsion, you have to spend a fair bit of time um, and energy on force. And so it makes you inefficient. Whereas if everybody is together on the project, then they'll, you don't have to spend any time on compulsion because people are compelling themselves. And so that's what he called an equilibrated state. So an equilibrated state was, well, we sit down and we have a negotiation. It's a real negotiation, so it it has to be honest. And we say, okay, well, what the hell are we doing? And everyone hashes that out, and we decide what we're doing. And then we decide how that would be good for all of us, but each of us singularly as well. So if you got your family put together properly, then the whole family moves together, but everybody inside moves ahead as well. And so then everybody's pushing in the same, you know, you know how it is in a negotiation. You actually want your interests to align with the interests of the other person because then you don't have to worry about the integrity of the deal. It's like everybody has reasons to keep it, to keep it thriving. And the idea that capitalism in somehow, is, somehow is predicated on the tyranny of the people at the, at the pinnacle, that happens when it gets corrupt. But it doesn't happen at all when it's working properly because deals that aren't based on mutual self-interest and group interest simultaneously have to be enforced usually with lawyers and then you're done, right? You're done at, at that point.
That's that's actually incredible. So I would, when I work with companies, I remember I was working with a company, this is a couple of years ago, maybe even three or four years ago, and you know they were talking about how they needed to hold their salespeople accountable, and that's what they needed to do, and they needed more accountability, and the sales leadership underneath them needed to hold all their frontline sales leaders accountable for everything, and, and follow these rules, and make these numbers of calls, and do these follow-up things, and send the follow-up emails, and they needed to get this accountability thing going. And this was the, when, when I heard this guy saying this, it was the first time I said, because I'd heard this a lot, this word accountability and leadership, you hear, oh, well, we just need better accountability, better accountability. And it's a trick because you think about it and you say to yourself, well, if I'm in charge of you guys and I'm gonna hold you accountable to make sure you do everything you're supposed to do, well, then we will successfully do what it is you, you will do because I held you accountable, I made you do it. The problem is, in any organization, there's too many people to hold everyone accountable to everything that they're supposed to be doing. So it just doesn't work. And so you could take one group, and this is what I said, I said if you've got one group where you have to hold them accountable for each and everything that you do, and you, and you try and do that, versus a group where people know what they're supposed to do and they wanna go and do it, I go, which, which team is gonna win? And he said, well, the group that wants to do it themselves, I go, that's what you need to do is get them to wanna to do it themselves, yeah, exactly. that's leadership. That's, well, exactly. The well, exact same thing you just well, described. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, look, if you get people to track everything they do, it takes them longer to track it than to do it. <laughs> Plus, they hate it. They hate it because they're not being trusted and it's the most terrible, dull administrative work and it just kills people who are actually productive because they're driven crazy by that. It's like, leave me the hell alone so I can do my work. <laughs>